Colonel Keith Morrow, U.S. Army retired, is the 633rd Mission Support Group, or MSG, Deputy Director for Installation Support at Joint Base Langley-Eustis, Langley Air Force Base. The 633 MSG is comprised of the 633rd Civil Engineering Squadron, the 633rd Communications Squadron, the 633rd Force Support Squadron, and the 633rd Security Forces Squadron. These subordinate organizations provide engineering services and installation support to 22,000 service members, families, and DOD civilians. I don't know if people realize the full impact that the military have on our region and our economy, but that's a very good example right there. Colonel Marr received a Bachelor of Science degree in music education. I love that. Uh, and a Master's of Art degree in National Security and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College. Following retirement from the Army in 2003, where he held a variety of command and staff positions as an infantry, transportation, and logistics officer, he entered civil service. And he has served in a variety of assignments with the Service Deployment and Distribution Command, Transportation Engineering Agency, U.S. Army Garrison Fort Eustis, the 733rd MSG, 633rd MSG of the 633rd Air Base Wing at Joint Base Langley Eustis. And he's now serving as the Deputy Director for Installation Support there. He was awarded the U.S. Department of the Army Superior Civilian Service Award and the U.S. Department of the Army Commander's Award for Civilian Service. So once again, we have a fantastic speaker for you today, Colonel Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I feel a little bit out of place because of all these engineers that keep coming up here to talk. And I'm a former infantryman and also a logistician. So it's, it, I feel honored to be here with all of these great uh, engineering folks. Um, I'm going to talk to you a few minutes here today about resiliency efforts on Joint Base Langley Eustis. And, and one of the first things I want to say is that one of the things that we've done, uh, it started about a year ago, was to get a joint land use study going uh, uh, off the ground with the city of Newport News for Fort Eustis. That's the first joint land use study that has ever been done that we can find. And that's not only looking at encroachment issues for uh, business and uh, residential areas, but is also looking into uh, tidal issues and, uh, uh, and, and to include the maritime uh, security issues for us because we do have, as, as Congressman Whitman mentioned, we do have the Army's Navy sitting, uh, most of it sitting at uh, Fort Eustis. The other thing, the other part of that joint land use study is an extension of the land use study that was done a couple of years ago at Langley, which is specifically looking at sea level rise. And our partners in those, the city of Newport News is with Fort Eustis and the Hampton is working uh, the, the lead on the, uh, the Langley part, portion for sea level rise. Those are both ongoing right now. And so we look forward to, to some great feedback on those once they get, uh, once they get finished. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fort Eustis. Um, we deal at, 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 let me just say, we've been at the strategic level in most of these discussions and I'm gonna bring you down to the installation level or the tactical level to let you know what we're doing. And actually what you will see, I think, as I go through this, that a lot of the, the strategic initiatives that, are, that were mentioned already are actually being implemented at the local installations. Uh, also talk very quickly about the, the legacy resource management program and how that affects Fort Eustis, and then some resiliency efforts at, um, at Langley. So as you can see from the chart here, this is a model that we use for emergency management purposes, mainly looking at the effects of storm surge. But it really uh, dovetails right into the sea level rise. So on the left, uh, you'll see the normal conditions. We do have a lot of wetlands at Fort Eustis. Um, about the, the upper 25% of Fort Eustis is actually contaminated area, where most of our buildings, uh, office space, motor pools and that are reside. And the lower three quarters is actually Mulberry Island, um, which is, we are restricted in some areas from using because of the wetlands areas, but that's our training areas, our ranges are over there, and also the airfield. So if you all remember um, Hurricane Isabel, Hurricane Isabel hit us with about a nine foot storm surge. And so the second one from the left is actually a projection uh, that we use, but that is about a seven foot storm surge from Isabel. 
and it shut down the installation for a couple of days. Uh, ultimately, we reopened and then became a FEMA site for, for uh, recovery. And then the, the final two on the right is looking at a category three or four uh, hurricane type event. Fortunately, we haven't had any of those, so we don't have any real life uh, experience with that. But that kind of looks to me like our 2070, 2100 projections that we saw a little bit earlier today. Um, so mo with most of our facilities residing in the, in the northern quarter, we don't have there as much of a problem with storm, or storm surge and or uh, sea level rise projections as we do in the training areas. But what we have been doing to try to assist ourselves, because uh, Langley and Eustace, along with NASA, actually are all 100 years old. Last year, Langley, next year, Eustace, this year, NASA. So we've got a lot of old facilities uh, interspersed with our newer facilities, and we've got a lot of aging infrastructure. So over the last few years for, at Fort Eustis, we have had a multi-million dollar pro, uh, series of projects to upgrade our stormwater uh, drainage pr uh, process by installing larger pipes, uh, our sewers, and our electrical to get them more resilient uh, in dealing with the normal day-to-day -day as well as the um, uh, st uh, storm issues. Uh, in addition to that at Fort Eustis, we've also over the last few years, been planting marsh grass, uh, installed riprap along the, uh, the, the mainly on the north, uh, let's see, in the northwest uh, section, kind of that flat area, because we've got facilities along that area as well to, um, to try to mitigate some of the tidal surge and also the, uh, the erosion. Uh, in, a, in addition to, to that, we've developed more projects for Fort Eustis. Uh, and as we already heard, that funding for some of that is, is, um, is limited by the services. And so we compete for all of that funding for not only our normal uh, maintenance and repair, but also for resiliency type projects. The, um, the big thing at, uh, for Fort Eustis is that those areas that we really see are, are impacted. We've been working uh, diligently to try to get projects in or to get projects complete to try to minimize uh, a lot of that. The long-term impact of Fort Eustis would be that sea level rise could, would adversely affect the operations of the, the readiness of the units because that lower three quarters, which would be underwater because it's already pretty much sea level or only a few feet, would affect the training capabilities at Fort Eustis. So we have to look and see how do we mitigate um, that. And the airfield is out in that area also, so it would impact our, our airfield. Um, in addition to developing uh, those, those projects, um, we also have two emerging uh, projects that are coming up. One is the archeological site management study uh, that, that is commissioned to look at 31 of our archeological sites because of the effect of, of sea level, or of, of erosion, or which goes in, coincides with sea level rise. Um, Fort Eustis in that, on the Mulberry Island site has about 250 archeological sites. And we've got 31 of those that are along the, the coast. A couple of years ago, we had a report uh, of some human remains that were out along the, uh, the, the coast, the, the shoreline. And it turns out that one of our uh, Native American burial sites had become uncovered. So we had to go out, recover that, reinter them, and worked with the Pamunkey tribe to do that. But that's one of the issues that we've been dealing with on the archaeological site. So this project is designed to take a look at what, what the, the impact is for those 31 sites and what we need to do long term. Some of them we might be able to uh, um, adjust, some of them we might not be able to do anything with simply because of the type of, of situation. And then the second uh, area is the DOSD Legacy Resource Management Program, which we just signed on to. It's a program that's being run by an AFAC down in Norfolk, and it's going to help, we think, um, with some of the shoreline erosion. And I have a couple of pictures, I think, that go along with that. This, this is designed to put oyster beds along the along the, um, the coast. These are hard uh, cement or hard surface oyster beds. And so there's three types that they look at. 
And so we hope to add these to our repertoire here um, at, in addition to what we've already done. So we move over to Langley. Langley, I think, as we've already seen, is, is a little bit more problematic for, for us on a day-to-day -day basis um, because of the, the effects of the, of, of, uh, the sea level. And so one of the things that we found out a couple of years ago that we were lacking was really a comprehensive plan on how to deal with this and some predictions uh, on what to do depending on the, the storm surge that we were uh, expecting. So our engineers went back and they took a look at what had happened in, uh, in no numerous storms recently. First one they looked at was 1933, uh, which doesn't really have too much information other than the water level and the wind speed. Uh, but you can also look down there in the bottom left-hand corner. I'm not sure if that guy is waiting for the bus or just exactly what he's doing. But, but obviously there was some major, major flooding during that time. So really fast forwarding up to 1999, we, all, we saw Hurricane Floyd come in, we had some impact, but even at that point, didn't really do any analysis on storms to determine what it is that we could do um, to be more predictive and to, to take initiative up front to be able to react uh, better for the, to the storms. Uh, Isabel went through, and that's a 7.9 uh, a a storm surge, and at that point, uh, once that happened, it was kind of a wake-up call because that, that pretty well flooded the, uh, a lot of the facilities, except I think at the center of the airfield and a few other areas, uh, at least for a short period of time. So since then, what our engineers have been doing is looking at lessons learned from each of these storms, and as we've gone through the process of these lessons learned, have been able to put into place some efforts that give us, uh, I think, a lot more resiliency at this particular point. And, and many of these, I think you've probably already seen. So for those of you at the policy level or at, at the theoretical level, it's nice to know that some of what you're doing is actually playing out at the local uh, installation level. Um, so we're gonna talk just very quickly here about some prevention things, about some pre uh, preparation and recovery efforts. So on the prevention side, we have been looking at shoreline stabilization, and this is similar to what we've been doing at Fort Eustis, but one of, one of the projects that, that was completed was a almost $5 million stabilization project, putting in about 10 kilometers of riprap along the, the shore, and then um, and also adding uh, seagrass in order to filter that. So, so that has been very uh, successful for us, and we're looking at some additional projects to get them on the shelf in order to expand that a bit. Um, the thing that we deal with right now is a 5.4 foot uh, seawall, or, or uh, that's ab above mean uh, sea level. So anything ab over sea, uh, storm surge that we get over 5.4 feet is going to cause us some flooding. And actually, as, as, um, as Congressman Whitman mentioned, even absent a 5.4, there are some days in that we will see a little bit of higher tide, maybe a little bit of water on roads in the areas. And those areas are the ones that we're looking at right now to try to mitigate in order to at least minimize the daily or, or the periodic uh, effects of, of any kind of increase in, in tidal surge. We've also looked at, at raising critical infrastructure and uh, appreciate the, the comments this morning on, on the, the philosophies behind that. Um, but it, truly, that's one of the things that we need to do at this particular point. What you see here on the left side is an HVAC system. On the right side, some transformers. Um, we're also looking at some other areas where we need to, to raise up. And in addition to that, um, our facilities guides now require that for f facilities that are inside the floodplain, that our floor level for those facilities be at least 10 feet above mean sea level. And so that will help us also. The problem that we've got at Langley uh, is that with a 100-year-old facility uh, installation, facilities are where they are. And so trying to mitigate those facilities at their current location uh, requires additional funding, and that funding is not being uh, 
is not readily available to us, so we have to look at how we prioritize our projects in order to make that happen. So in the preparation arena, we also have some predictive modeling that we, and we partnered with NASA in order to develop this flood prediction model and put in some elevation points so that it's easy for us to track what's going on. As the storm surge comes in, we can actually get some, some relatively good uh, data. And, and it's a, a really powerful decision tool for us in, in being able to work projects and know where it is that we need to put our limited resources. We've also, I think somebody showed this picture a little bit earlier also, we constructed a five, point, a five million dollar high efficiency pump to, to pull water off the airfield. As our one critical mission is how fast can we get the airfield back in operation? And at this point, these pumps, uh, which are actually located over towards the NASA area, can draw about 7.4 million gallons off the airfield an hour. And that has really saved us uh, time and mission, um, a loss of mission requirements for the last several years since that has been completed. So we, um, we find that with the 100 years of supporting Langley and Eustace, the engineers have provided me with some lessons learned. First of all, they learned from Isabel that basements are not the right place to put folks to work. <laughs> um, and also, they learned that basements are not a good place to put mechanical rooms. So our recovery projects that we've been looking at and been developing are really designed to move some of those, that structure in some of our older facilities up and out of those areas where we have groundwater uh, or, or have the ability for storm surge to, um, to come in. Isabel caused us to, to look at a lot more nuances in the flooding, to really think outside the box. One of our Sabre folks, which is our, our local contractor, when we were repairing some of the old uh, hangars after a storm event, actually came up with a really novel idea. It's like, why didn't we think of this before? But rather than replacing all the sheetrock on the, on the walls, is to replace the wall with tile up to the level of flooding and then replace sheetrock above that. Um, it's, it's one of those duh moments that you got that says, man, we should have thought about that a long time ago. A little bit more expensive on the, on the front end, but it pays dividends because then you squeegee off the wall and you don't have to worry about uh, all, the other, all the other items. And uh, some of the hangars would, would flood uh, e even though the, the waters were not flowing out over the ground, they were coming in from under the ground. And so as a result of that, we put in a, a tidal gate and a stormwater pump station, which then helps to alleviate the flooding uh, from, the from the groundwater at the older hangars, and we haven't had as much, near as much of a problem with that since then. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing at the local level. Um, if, and, and really, uh, from a day-to-day -day basis, the tactical level is the things that we have to do. One of the things that we are finding is the way that the Air Force, I think the services in general, fund their projects, is as we get funding for projects, the project funding comes for based on the conditions of facilities. So there's a mission index, a dependency index of what is the mission of the installation, how old is it, how much money have you been putting against it. The projects that we need here, as I think we had somebody alluded to earlier, are those preventive projects. They don't score very well. And so we are trying to work with the Air Force uh, Civil Engineering Center to see if we can't get them to adjust some of their scoring so that these projects, which actually pre protect not just a single facility, but a lot of facilities, um, can get a higher score so that we can, uh, uh, allegedly, we can get a little bit more money in those projects to help us get become more resilient than we already are. So with that, um, thank you very much, and do I have any questions? And if we do, I have my engineers here who can probably answer them. <laughs>